Bien, bonjour. Aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir de recevoir à nouveau Sally Kepler, qui était venu il y a peut-être euh, deux ans, quelque chose comme ça, ou un an et demi, pour vous présenter euh, plus un travail sur les Borrelia, puisque c'est une des euh, personnes qui connaît le mieux les Borrelioses en Afrique, en particulier en Afrique de l'Est. Et là, elle euh, présente euh, de façon plus générale euh, ses, ses connaissances sur le domaine des zoonoses, qui est évidemment un, un domaine qui nous concerne beaucoup. Et donc, on la remercie d'avoir accepté à nouveau de venir à Marseille aujourd'hui pour euh, nous éclairer sur son Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to start with an apology. My lecture is going to be in English. So if I'm going too quickly, please raise your hands and I'll try and slow down a little bit. Okay, so what I'm going to chat about this afternoon is emerging and re-emerging zoonosis in the changing world. So just to briefly summarize the elements I want to cover, I want to go through and just consider well, what do we actually mean by zoonosis. Also, I want to try and give a little bit of an understanding of some of the factors that actually influence why we see new and emerging or re-emerging zoonosis. What are the factors that actually drive this, that help things to change? And what can we do about it? How are we going to intervene and break that chain of infection? So that, in a nutshell, is what I hope to cover in this lecture. So now I want to transport you back in time and just ask a little bit about the word zoonosis. Where did it come from? And what does it actually mean? So if we go back to the time of Rudolf Herschel and he lived between 1821 to 1902, and he actually first introduced this term, zoonosis. And he used this as drawing an analogy of between animals and humans. And so this nice little quote here summarizes what he said. Between animals and human medicine, there are no dividing lines, and nor should there be. And I think that has really stood the test of time. But then we've also got to keep an open mind when we're considering what zoonoses actually are. Just recently, it became apparent that Mycobacterium leprae is probably also a zoonosis. They were able to find identical DNA sequences <coughs> of a strain in armadillos compared to what they were finding in the human population. So again, probably associated with contact with animal reservoirs. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit more about what we actually feel zoonosis are. OK, so generally, zoonosis have been regarded as diseases from animals. And this comes from the word zoon, the animal, from the Greek. And so Virtue <coughs> actually used the term when he was discussing animal poisons, because they didn't know much about the microbiology underpinning these infections at that time. And then people thought they were a little bit clever about defining what was actually meant. And so they tried to actually put in some direction in the nomenclature that was being used. And so your zoonosis, or zooanthroposis, were the direction going from animals to humans. And then if infections were going from humans to animals, they put in a whole different word, anthroponosis or anthroposinosis, going from humans to animals. And then to try and complicate the situation even more, they thought, well, what about the infections that don't have an animal reservoir or that they're not going between humans and animals? So if you've got a non-vertebrate source, such as water, food, soil, anything like that, and they refer to those as saponoses. But then you have to also think, well, sometimes it's not whole organism packaging. Sometimes it's actually a gene that's responsible for the virulence, the infection. So maybe you need another term for that as well. And so some people have introduced the term parasomosis when you're talking about a specific virulence gene. 
that may come from another source. So an example of that would be things like the gene encoding the production of sugar toxin. But then I want to throw a question out to you. Why do you have to have a vertebrate involved? What about amoeba? What about invertebrates? So shouldn't we actually be considering those as well? So why, why are we so hung up with having to have a vertebrate involved? And maybe we should just be talking about multi-host infections. So another way of trying to categorize zoonosis is to actually break them up by how often you see them, the kind of circumstances that you see them in. And so here's another scheme to try and divide them up a little bit. You can have your endemic zoonosis, and these are probably the ones that have actually got the biggest impact on ourselves. But they're also probably the most difficult ones to find because they're always there. What are you going to do about it? That's just part of life. We live with those infections. And so, for funding, it's usually easier if you've got something that's going to be an epidemic infection, an epidemic zoonotic infection. And you can have things falling into this category, like anthrax, rabies, rift valley, leishmaniasis. And then another area that really sort of seizes the popular press, the headlines, and also gets a lot of the research funding, is the area of emerging new zoonotic infections. Because here, there's a lot of panic, a lot of concern, because we don't know. It's unpredictable. We don't know how the disease is going to spread, how big an outbreak is it going to be, or is it going to be something like the uh, new coronavirus that spills into the human population just a few months back, where a couple of cases and it seems to have vanished. We don't know where the geographical range of some of these is going to be. All kinds of things can actually change with these new and emerging zoonoses. Now, I want to take you right back to a few basic bits of microbiology here. So, you can't just focus on the pathogen itself. And this is really important when you're considering zoonotic infections as well. You can't just look here. You also need to consider the host and the environment or microenvironment that brings <coughs> those in. So I just wanted to remind you of that. Then another point. A zoonosis always in a pathogenic role. And a lot of the time, if you look at the natural reservoir, for that particular infection. It's not always there in a pathogenic role. A lot of the time there's been many, many years of co-evolution of that particular micro to live in that particular host. And they've co-evolved together. They've actually adapted together. And for some infections, for instance, if you look at cowpox virus, and the name is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually got its natural reservoir in small rodents. And if you get some of these rodents that are carrying cowpox virus, their longevity, their ability to survive for longer, is actually greater than some of the rodents that aren't carrying the virus. So you have to think, well, is that really the role of the pathogen? Probably not. Now, from the virus point of view, that's actually a good thing, because the longer the lifespan of your host, the greater probability of opportunities to transmit further. A lot of the time, the pathogenic role is only seen when you get infection spilling into an accidental host, and there you see clinical consequences. Now, apologies for this being a little bit complicated, but it gives you a nice summary of some of the different factors that actually influence the zoonotic infections that we see. So I'm just going to walk you around this diagram a little bit. We are going to dip into a lot of these topics a little bit more as we go on through the talk. Now, if you think, well, what's changing? 
And most people say, climate, that's what's changing. So obviously climate change is an important factor. And certainly it has a huge impact when you're talking about arthropod-borne infections, of which many zoonoses actually are. Because climate will influence the geographical range of where these various arthropod vectors can live, and also the ability of how, which portions of the year they're going to be active. So again, it can actually broaden that transmission window during the seasons. So we'll come back a little bit to that a bit later. Then you've got movement, translocation of infected animals, inf infected produce, infected goods, and people. People move around a lot through tourism. It's quite normal now for people to have international travel several times a year. And then other factors like change in land use. So as you've noticed, there are more and more people, and so there are demands on land to try and facilitate a support for that number of people. And then we've already alluded to the fact that things are quite dynamic. Pathogens evolve, they change, they adapt, and they can even adapt to new host species. HIV, for instance, has adapted to being in humans. Acquisition of new virulence traits. We mentioned some virulence traits like sugar toxin genes. So look at what's been happening with the E. coli over the recent years. And then alteration in management of livestock can have profound effects on zoonotic infection. Companion animals, well, where would we be without our pets? They have a very important role and they live in our same close environment. So they again can be a strong influencing force on infections. Desire for exotic foods, bushmeat for instance, that again can be a vehicle to actually introduce new infections into the human population. And not only do we like exotic foods, but we also like exotic pets. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on in the talk. So this just gives you a summary of some of the emerging infections, emerging zoonotic infections that have happened over recent years. This is going from 2004 to 2011. And it's probably a little bit small for you to actually make out. Um, okay, these are labelled as emerging zoonotic infections. But some of them have emerged through our emerging technologies. We've got better at our molecular diagnostics, for instance. And for many of these infections, you'll see a whole variety of new rickettsias, for instance. So I've got rickettsia up here and some um, new viruses. This is because we're, we're getting more skilled at our pathogen discovery. We're going out actively looking for new infections that might be there. So that will actually influence a little bit of what you see in this kind of map. You might try and turn things around a different way and say, well, okay, I'm important in these four infections because they've been labeled as really top important priority zoonosis. So you can again look at hot spots around the globe of where you're getting changing disease patterns and increase in prevalence of these particular zoonoses. And you can look at countries. Well, where are most of these emerging zoonoses actually coming from? Where are the countries that are exporting a lot of these around the world? And apologies if you're from some of these countries, um, but the top list for emerging zoonosis that came out of quite an extensive study that was recently published by Ilri were Nigeria, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Turkey, India. And why these countries? Well, in these particular locations, you actually have a lot of poverty. Quite often you end up with situations where you've got mixed animal species in very intensive situations, close proximity, which gives a lovely mechanism for infections to go from one to another. Quite often you've got a very close proximity 
How did life start with mine? I always remember when I was out in Peru, and I was just in Lima, and we were traveling around some of the poorer areas in Lima, and somebody opened up their front door, and out came a flock of 20-odd sheep that were going out to graze. So sometimes people have got very close proximity with their livestock. But also, don't forget the close proximity with wildlife as well. And they say, wherever there's a person, there's a rat probably about six meters away. OK, so just to dig into some of the factors that are actually influencing why we're seeing changing patterns of zoonotic infection. Well, we've mentioned already the increased international travel, our connectivity around the globe. And so this is through tourism, business travel, visiting relatives abroad, all kinds of different reasons. But we're all traveling far more. And that's become very much of the modern world. It's not just people, but it's also our livestock, for instance. Our food, go to a supermarket, and things that you're buying, produce from Cape Town or somewhere else around the globe. So that's all moving as well. And even things like international sporting events. If you've got racehorses, and it gets to winter time, you can't race them anymore, the ground's too hard. So ship your racehorses off to Saudi Arabia, and then you can carry on racing them the whole year round and bring them back again. And exotic pets, it will come back to you a little bit later. So some of the other factors that might actually influence. Well, a lot of these are actually man-made factors, anthropogenic factors, that are going to influence the dynamics of the infections that we actually see. Certainly, there's a lot of activity to try and produce more in the way of crops. And in areas that are going through periods of drought, perfect solution, let's put in irrigation. But what are the problems that are going to piggyback on that particular intervention? Well, water, mosquitoes, more malaria, all kinds of different things like that. You'll see people living more and more in urban environments. But not every area of that urban environment is going to be affluent. And we're seeing huge growth of sprawling slums where there are many stray animals, close to people, a hotbed for emerging infection. And then another thing that we're seeing is a spread in non-native species. Because we are moving animals around, animals sometimes escape, and sometimes they're more competent at multiplying in the new environment they found themselves than some of the original native species. And so they overtake and change the local dynamics. Also, we see a reduction in biodiversity. I'm old enough to remember waking up in the morning and hearing a wonderful dawn chorus of birds. And now, we've got cast sparrows and pigeons and not much else. So, huge reduction <coughs> in the biodiversity of the wildlife that we're seeing around us. So, there's an increase in globalization. Um, these facts, I'm sure you're all very familiar with. They've been reported in many papers on zoonosis over the last few years. There's a lot of people. Humans are growing in numbers. And the prediction is, by about 2050, we'll be up between the 9 and 11 billion human mark. So to sustain that level of population means that you've got a lot of intensification of farming. Through the globalization, you've got people traveling, and an infection that starts in one country can now rapidly travel the globe in a matter of weeks. And we saw this beautifully with the Mexican swine flu that just took a matter of weeks to spread around the globe. Other things that are important factors are things like changing land use, which again we have to to support the growing numbers of people around the globe. And climatic change, 
again is causing problems in rainfall, droughts, flooding, all kinds of episodes like that, which has a knock-on influence also on vector-borne diseases. And then we get social influences as well. Things like huge religious celebrations. People going to Mecca, for instance, for the Hajj. National holidays. In Finland, for instance, and I think sort of quite in December, they have a day of national holiday. So they all go out to their rural dwellings and they drink lots and lots of alcohol and they fall over and they expose themselves to lots of rodents and it comes down with outbreaks of antivirus infection that seem to always follow the festive days. Political upheavals and conflicts, again, can influence the emerging patterns of where we see certain diseases around the globe. And don't forget the economy. This, again, can actually influence the diseases you see. If you're very wealthy, maybe you can keep traveling around the globe and picking up infections from all over the place. Or if you're very poor, you need to go and forage in the forest for food so that you can pick berries, mushrooms, <coughs> whatever, to try and supplement your diet. So another important factor to consider. Talking about climate change, here one of the biggest impacts we see is regular flooding. So water and transmitted infections, which is leptospirosis, we're seeing more and more frequently. The temperature change itself is going to have an impact on the abundance of vectors, um, the particular geographical range where they can survive. And we've seen things like Lyme boreosis heading further and further north into Scandinavia now. Leishmaniasis, again, is on the move and spreading because of changes in climate. And weather-related disasters. Here again, it's not just the disaster itself, but sometimes the, the grouping together of people and refugee camps and things like that, where they're clustered together, perfect for spreading an emergence of disease. And we've already mentioned the irrigation systems. So, the fact that humans can actually be involved in actually instrumental in changing a lot of these patterns of disease. It's not a new thing. We've actually seen this quite a few years back with the spread of Aedes albopictus uh, mosquitoes around the globe. And this was associated with industry. The used tire trade and used tires have always got a little bit of residual water in them, which makes a wonderful portable breeding ground for mosquitoes. The desire for bushmeat, for instance, and I can remember doing a lecture at my university and I was talking a little bit about bushmeat and a hand waved up at the back of the lecture theatre and I said, yes, what is it? And the student said, Miss, have you ever tasted bushmeat? And I said, well, not to my knowledge. And she then went on and said, if you've ever tasted it, you'll realise why people will never give it up. So you can say, well, it's not a sensible thing to eat primates, for instance. But if, people, if there's demand, that'll always happen. Where there's demand, legal or illegal trade will happen. So are we ever going to conquer things like that? And then we get the juxtaposition, the, the close proximity of agriculture and people together. Beautiful example of this that we saw just a few years ago was the outbreak of Q fever in the Netherlands, starting in 2007, going right through to 2010, where you've got lots of goat farming and lots of people close together. Recipe for Q fever. And then there have been all kinds <coughs> of outbreaks that have been described over the years associated with our globalization. Um, for instance, there was a, a wonderful story that happened in Belgium, and it was a, a cashmere wool factory. Uh, basically, they were getting their wool from Afghanistan. The wool was laden with anthrax spores. They were shipping that into Brussels. They detected when they were doing surveillance around the factory lots of anthrax spores. Luckily, not enough to cause human infection, but it, that would have been the next stage if it hadn't been 
spotted. Just to give you an example of how much globalization goes on, just looking at America alone, 1.4 million people per day. When you're looking at animals and their movement across into the States, 38,000 daily going into the States. So this is actually a huge influence that's going to drive potential emergency infection. And a lot of this is facilitated through air travel. And it's not just the people that are traveling, but sometimes you get stowaways, arthropods, that will fly in onto the, um, via aircraft as well. So much so that round airports and round Heathrow, for instance, in the UK, we've got airport malaria, where the mosquitoes have flown out, they're hungry after their long travel, they bite, fly out of the plane, bite somebody, and give them malaria. Okay, they, on the aircraft they do spray around, but that's probably not wonderfully effective. We've also <coughs> seen the rapid translocation of influenza, SARS, again facilitated through air travel, and potentially even the introduction of West Nile into the States. When they looked at the phylogeny of the viruses, it showed homology of strain circulating in Israel, too far from mosquito to fly. Tourism. Well, we all like to go on holidays. And um, when we go on holiday, we quite often like to go somewhere exotic, somewhere very different to where we live. And so places like Thailand, Malaysia, Africa, all kinds of locations like that. And what do we do when we're on holiday? totally mad things with regard to putting yourself at risk of infectious diseases. And you can see me on the back here doing mad things on holiday. So even people who should know better don't. So a lot of the time we go to places with a good climate. And this really promotes outdoor activity, whether it be sort of water sports, hiking, all kinds of different things. And when you're exposed to a different um, environment, you like to try different exotic foods, local delicacies, for instance, that again can put you at risk. When you're going on holiday, why not go and stay in rustic accommodation and get back to nature? Well, this happens quite often, but remember when you do go and stay in more rustic accommodation, you're going to be exposing yourself to rodent infestations, snakes, arthropods, all kinds of different things. And I always remember a story of the lady I was staying with in Africa, and she went to stay um, in rustic accommodation on a little bit of a safari for a weekend, and she complained that she couldn't sleep during the night because she heard all this rustling noise. And it was because she had rats in her pillow. Um, she stayed in developing countries, for instance, they may not have vacuum cleaners to hoover up the carpets. I remember a stay in a hotel in Ethiopia, and I walked into my hotel room and thought, ouch, something's bitten me. Looked down at the carpet, and the whole carpet was hopping with human fleas. A lot of the time, fleas from these countries carry organisms such as rickettsia felis, probably 60-70% of them are carrying the So what are you going to be exposing yourself to there? Some countries where malaria is endemic don't actually have bed nets provided. So again, you could actually be offering yourself to mosquitoes during the night when you're sleeping. And if you're mad enough to want to actually go camping, well, you're going to expose yourself to a whole variety of different risks. Then, eating unusual foods. Again, something we want to do quite often when we're on holiday. Bush meat, we've already mentioned. But it, you may not want to enjoy and savour the delicacies of bush meat, but you might be more tempted by something like the locally produced cheeses. Well, a lot of these cheeses are made from unpasteurised milk. You can go to market stores, for instance, in Peru, and they will say which cheese was made from pasteurized milk and which ones were from unpasteurized milk. But the unpasteurized milk 
oh, those are better. Always have those ones. So if you hadn't asked that question, and you just said, which is your best cheese? They would say, that one. And you would be then consuming cheese made from unpasteurized milk. And when abroad, well, all these wonderful activities you might want to partake in as well. Swimming, water-related activities like canoeing, white water rafting that you can see down there, where you're going to have a lot of potential contact with animal reservoirs of infection. And then, of course, arthropods as well, big risk of getting exposed to arthropods. And when we actually look at the kind of infections that come back associated with people going on tourist-related trips, no surprise, malaria is at the top there. But look at these ones here as well, that you may be a little bit more surprised to see. Rickettsia, very, very important. Brucellosis, leptospirosis, schistosomiasis, dengue, a whole variety of different exotic fungal infections, and the list goes on. Less commonly, things like rabies, lassa, quite significant infections. And then if that wasn't good enough, you might want to go to a local spa, a health spa, to enjoy that when you're on holiday, or maybe to get over the stress of traveling when you return home. And very fashionable thing, around the globe at the moment is to have foot pedicures. Have you ever had one of these? Any of you? No? Basically, you immerse your foot into a tank full of these fish, doctor fish. And these fish feed on the dead skin on your foot. Now, needless to say, these fish don't actually live for a particularly long period of time because you're going to be putting your foot in there and is that really a good environment for the fish? So a lot of the time the fish die quite rapidly, have a rapid turnover, which means we need to keep importing them. And where do we get them from? Well, places like the Philippines, Indonesia, all kinds of places like that. So there's a survey that was published in um, Emerging Infectious Diseases recently, and they looked at importation of some of these doctor fish from Indonesia. And they found that they were carrying mycobacteria, um, group B streptococci, vibrio cholera, luckily a non-toxigenic one, and vibrio vomificus. So some pretty significant pathogens here. I don't think there's been any reported case of anyone actually acquiring these yet, but I think that's just a matter of time. What other things might you want to do? Well, let's take the kids off to a petting farm. And what are people going to do at a petting farm? Well, certainly the younger members of the group are likely to pet the animals. They'll bottle feed the lambs, they'll cuddle the animals. And wonderful opportunities for exchange of infections, as you can see there. And typically what we'll see is infections associated with things like E. coli, O157s. We'll see quite a lot of outbreaks associated with that. Um, Coxiello was reported with visits to petting farms from the Netherlands during the outbreak that they were having, and things like Campylobacter pseudomonas infection as well, quite often seen. When you come back from your holiday, you see your pet again, and what do you want to do when well, you want to cuddle your pet? You want to share your environment with your pet. So wonderful proximity, and that means sharing your plate with your pet, sharing your dinner with your pet and even sharing your bed with your pet as well. And needless to say, if you are sharing your bed with your pet, whether it be a bowl or something a bit smaller like a cat, what's going to happen if you roll on that pet during the night? Or you have a little bit of a nightmare or something? It might bite you. It might scratch you. Opportunities for exposure again. Typically, things like animal bites, pasteurella infections associated with animals. And if regular pets aren't good enough, why not go on the internet and order up an exotic pet? Because then you can show off to your friends and say, well, I've got this, this is much better than your pet. And you can order up virtually any type of exotic animal. Huge trade in exotic pets. 
And these are just a few images taken from looking around on the internet. And you can see how many, the variety of different exotic pets. And then there are fashions in clothes, there are fashions in pets. And why not change your pet to keep up with fashion? And sometimes this can be linked with all kinds of things that you wouldn't normally expect as driving influences, such as movies that come out. Ratatouille. Well, this really promoted how wonderful rats were to share your home with. And so all the children were saying, I want a rat for Christmas, please. So obedient parents do what their children tell them to. And there was a huge upsurge in pet rats. And this was associated with all kinds of zoonotic infections associated with rats, such as leptospirosis, cowpox, quite a few outbreaks actually of cowpox in Germany, for instance. If you decide to go more along the route of keeping reptiles, well, there again, you've got to think about how you're going to feed your reptiles, which we'll come on to in the next slide. And other trends are things like these cute little African pygmy hedgehogs and prairie dogs, what we've heard about the problems with zoonotic outbreaks associated with those recent outbreaks in the States. So if you've got an unconventional pet, you need to give them relatively unconventional food. So you can actually buy your food for your pets over the internet as well. And you can get these huge blocks of pinkies, they're called, newborn mice. And you put this in the freezer with all your food and everything else you've got at home. And you just break off a few every time you want to feed your pet reptile. And the problem they found is that a lot of these pinkies, these newborn mice, were heavily laden with salmonella. Quite an exotic species of salmonella that we haven't seen spilling into the human population before. And when you actually did the investigations, it turned out that most of the people coming down with infection had reptiles and they were buying these blocks of frozen newborn mice to feed their reptiles. Uh, when you look at wildlife importation, just to give you an idea of the scale, this is a study from 2009 from the EID, just looking at what was going into the United States. And look at the huge number of mammals being imported. 190 different genera during the study period of five years. And when they actually looked at the infections that were coming in with these animals, 78 genera were carrying babies virus. 57 of them were bacillus anthracis, and so on and so forth. So the potential <coughs> to actually import infections with this movement of animals, wildlife coming in, is huge, absolutely huge. Don't think we've got time to actually link into this now, but if you're bored or if you're going to travel and you want to see what infections are actually there in the destination you're going to, you might want to just click into this link and you'll be able to see what infections, what outbreaks are going on in the part of the world that you're traveling to. So I'll leave you to do that just a little bit of homework. Now, new and emerging infectious diseases. There are a lot of risk factors that need to come together to actually facilitate that new and emerging infection to spill into the human population. And so I want you to think a little bit about risk assessment here. And the model that's been used to describe all these different influences that come together to promote the emergence of a new infection. It's been likened to slices of Swiss cheese. And as you know, Swiss cheese is full of holes, as you can see here. Now, we've talked a lot about different driving influences and forces. And you actually need a lot of these to actually come together and align to give that opportunity for a new infection to spill into the human population. <coughs> An example of when this actually happened was in Malaysia with Nipah virus. 
and the farmers there were pig farmers and they were doing rather well but they wanted to do a little bit better and so why not expand the produce they're actually producing so rather than just pigs why not plant up a few orchards and have lots of fruit trees around the periphery of the farm so they did that loads of fruit what else likes fruit bats so the bats moved in because of the fruit. So you ended up with a situation, yeah, going through our holes of Swiss cheese, where you have lots of pigs, lots of bats, and people all in close proximity. And so Nipah virus is carried by bats. The bats were defecating, salivating all over the fruit. That was dropping off the trees. The pigs were eating it. The virus got into the pigs and then it spills into the human population. <coughs> so all these slices of Swiss cheese align together and an outbreak of infection happened. While we're talking about Nipah virus, there's also a big problem in Bangladesh. And one of the things they like to do and harvest in Bangladesh is palm sand using for wine and things. So basically, if you're going to harvest this from one of the palm trees, you need to cut the tree and you put your container underneath that cut in the tree and you keep it there for several days while you harvest the sap. Now, the big problem they were having was Nipah virus associated with this sap. And why? Well, the sap is very, very sweet. And so the bats like it. So during the night, bats were coming to where they were actually harvesting the sap from the tree. And the bats were feeding, salivating in it, and worse, they were actually urinating in it as well. Because if you drink a lot, you need to go to the toilet. And so the bats were doing just that, and that was getting in there as well. Perfect way of facilitating transmission into something that would be consumed by humans. But going back to that Swiss cheese model, how can you actually stop that introduction of infection into the human population? Break the <coughs> infection. How do you misalign one of those slices of Swiss cheese? So what you can do is very simple controls. You can actually put a cover over that jug that you're collecting the palm sun. And that will stop the bats getting access to it, salivating in it, urinating in it, and everything else. And so it forms a segregation, a block, a physical block. You can also educate people to make sure that this kind of safer way of harvesting is actually used. And you can also look at improving processing as well to try and break that chain of infection. All different types of intervention, practical interventions to reduce the burden of zoonosis. Another initiative that's been going on for a few years now is this One Health, One Medicine initiative. And there's no official set definition for this, but the general concept is encapsulated within this quote here. A collaborative effort by multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to attain optimal health for people, animals, and their environment. So it means we've got to be a lot more joined up. You can't just think of yourself interested in human health without thinking, well, to have human health, you need to have control of infections in animals as well. And the wildlife and the environment. It's all joined up together. So really, we're getting much more of an appreciation now of this intimacy, this relationship between different disciplines that used to be fragmented and split. Another way of intervening would be use of vaccines, for instance. And certainly, this has had really good results for reducing the burden of infections such as rabies. But only really in the developing countries. So 
So we've now really brought down the levels of rabies in these places. But what about the poor countries, the developing nations? Who is going to fund and promote a rabies reduction measure going on in these countries? So that's something that still needs to be addressed. But can you actually use this strategy and roll it out to look at other zoonotic diseases? Well, this has certainly been sought of quite a long time ago, and people have explored this possibility. Um, going back in time again, back to 1897, Sir Arnold Wright, well, his nickname currently has been Sir Almost Wright, because a lot of the time, the thoughts were in the right direction, but what he actually did wasn't quite there. And so he thought he'd use this strategy that worked for many infections at the time of let's produce a vaccine. So you get your pathogen, you cook it to kill it, vaccinate yourself, and then you do the challenge experiment. And all good microbiologists at the time used self-medication. So he vaccinated himself with killed Brucella melitensis, and then did the challenge experiment and came down with a rather nasty dose of brucellosis. It didn't work. So let's look a little bit more about vaccines and their ability to control brucellosis. Well, several live vaccines have been used quite successfully in some circumstances to reduce the burden of brucellosis. And you've got live vaccines such as S19 for cattle, Rev1 for sheep and small ruminants, and more recently things like RB51. So these have actually been really good, used in combination with things like test and slaughter campaigns, and also tracking the movement of animals so that you can actually follow where they've been. And you can actually put it's <coughs> almost like a, a movement passport into place. So this has certainly been good at reducing the level of brucellosis, and where you reduce the level of brucellosis in the animal reservoir, the knock-on effect is that you reduce the level of brucellosis in people. So that was all working really well. So let's take it a little bit further, and can we actually get rid of brucellosis in wildlife? Well, this is where things started to go a bit wrong, and they found that even though these vaccines worked in the target species for which they've been originally developed, they didn't work so well when you apply them to various wildlife. For instance, if you vaccinated um, bison and elk with some of these vaccines, you caused abortion. So they still retained virulence in wildlife species, even though they worked well in cattle. Another problem is the fact that these attenuated strains are still virulent in humans, which means that you get a veterinarian trying to vaccinate animals and needles together, always a bad combination. That needle is going to slip and go into the vet. So a lot of brucella was acquired in people through vaccination with uh, these live vaccine strains. A lot of vaccine strains express the surface antigens that are used also in diagnostic tests. So if you've used a vaccine, you're going to have animals that test seropositive. So it invalidates a lot of your surveillance and your diagnostics. This is in part why they invented a new vaccine strain that didn't express the surface polysaccharide and doesn't interfere quite so much. But these are live strains. And so they can change. They can actually revert to full virulence as well. So that's another problem. And because they're live streams, there's standardization issues, there's all kinds of cost implications. So it's a lot more complicated to actually roll it out. So all the licensed vaccines at the moment are live strains because they're live strains, too dangerous to try and use in humans, but the problem with humans 
is the fact that these strains are still fully virulent in humans. You need to look at active local multiplication to actually promote a really good, effective immune response to cause protection. You need a really good Th1 inflammatory cytotoxic response to be able to control brucellosis. So you're not going to get that with subunit vaccines particularly well. You can reduce the human burden of disease by reducing the disease in animals, we've already mentioned that. But we've got a problem with how to deal with spillovers into wildlife. And so livestock will keep getting infected again from contact with wildlife. And these points down here we've already mentioned. Just to give you another example, leptospirosis. Well here, we're actually seeing something that's beginning to re-emerge as a major problem. And over recent years, there have been massive outbreaks in Nicaragua, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines with leptospirosis. Some of this has been linked to extreme weather events and climatic change, changes in land use, and globalization as well. But when you're thinking about vaccination for leptospirosis, well, there's over 20 different genus species. And within these genus species, there are almost 300 different serovars. And then there's non-pathogenic leptospirosis as well, just to complicate things even further. Now, a lot of the vaccines produced are serovar specific. They will not give cross protection against the other serovars. So you have to know which strain is there and produce the vaccine just against that particular strain. Which means that it's, it's not a very good vaccine, it's not very good at controlling infection. And another problem you get is when you vaccinate animals, for instance, all it stops is the presentation of clinical manifestations. It doesn't stop them excreting leptospirus into the environment. So you have to think about, okay, maybe reduce clinical burden, but have you actually reduced environmental contamination and the risks to humans? So, other ways of controlling leptospirosis. Well, let's kill all the rodents. That's not going to work, is it? You might be able to reduce the burden in certain situations, but it's not an effective control. You could try to vaccinate animals that have close contact with humans, but the rats, They've got close contact. How are you going to vaccinate them? It's not going to work. You can try and control stray populations. And here's some really manky stray dogs from the streets of Peru. You can try and get those euthanized and away from being a potential reservoir. But again, not a very effective way. You could use vaccines. But the vaccines are not cross-protected. You can only do this for certain serovars. And where they've had some of these massive outbreaks of human leptospirosis, they have actually gone in with locally produced vaccines against the locally prevalent strains. Um, there's hope that vaccines will become more refined, subunit defined vaccines that will be safe enough to give to human populations. But this is still far from reality. But another question I want to leave you with is what do you actually want from the vaccine? The vaccine you want to produce for protection of the human population may have different requirements to those that you would want to produce for an animal population. So I just want to raise a few of these issues with you. For a human population, you're talking about protection of the individual. You can use crude vaccines that has been done in these major outbreaks that I described a little bit earlier. But ideally, for a human vaccine, it'd be nice to have a clean, defined, subunit vaccine that would hopefully give quite a long duration of immunity. Hopefully also, cross serovar protection, so that you don't have to get 300 different vaccines to cover you against all the pathogens that just far up. You would ideally want it so it wouldn't interfere with diagnostics, so that you could still use surveillance. Now, these, these requirements are going to make your vaccine too expensive. 
for agricultural use. Because of the investment that needs to go into producing something like that, it would never be something cheap enough for use in an agricultural mm -hmm. setting. For animals, you're talking about, rather than the individual, you're talking about protection at the herd level. Sure, you can use whole leptospira-based vaccines, but you need to know which one is the problem in your area. So if the vaccine producer is based in the States, what they're producing is not going to be relevant to the one causing a problem in your area. A lot of the time, if you're looking at a sort of relatively unsophisticated vaccine, you've got something that will give up to about 12 months of protection. You want to see that that reflects the relevant local prevalent serovirus. But these vaccines, although they're cheap, they can complicate diagnostic surveillance in the area because of that um, means of actually producing the vaccine against the particular serovirus. It's also that that's going to be used to do diagnostic antigen. So, a few thoughts, and hopefully I've provoked a few questions. So, run over a little bit, but there's a few minutes for questions. So have any of you got any questions you want to ask me about some of the various areas that we've gone over? Just two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In your introduction, you said that some viruses appear to prolong the lifespan of the host. Yes. I have three small questions there. Any such virus known, known for humans? <laughs> and shouldn't they be looked for? And what are the principles that would make them work? Basically, I can't give you an example in humans. I'm sure we'd all love to know. <laughs> Um, so I think that is investigation that still needs to be done. With regards to the um, example that I gave in cowpox virus, basically it's, it's partly in the virus's best interest to actually ensure that its host is going to live for a long period of time. It's, it's getting into, but sometimes we have to think more holistically, not just from our point of view. Look at, for instance, the effects of a pathogen on behavior that you get with toxoplasmosis. Yes? So the toxoplasmosis will go from its normal reservoir in a cat, okay? And then it will have another reservoir, usually a rodent, okay? So it then needs to, the organism, the pathogen, then needs to get back into the cat. So by changing the behavior of the rodent so that it takes more risks, the pathogen actually gets back yeah, into... There must have been a few, a few million years of... The, the evolution that's gone into that mechanism is absolutely awesome and amazing. But when you've got a prolonged co-evolution, and sometimes you have to view things not just from the host's perspective, but also from the pathogen's perspective, because we're in this together. We co-evolve together. And so I think so we it, have it, to take a broader view. But the human host would be the best of all hosts as it travels everywhere. But we, we use not to. It would be radioactive and spreading, wouldn't it? <laughs> we're, we're certainly traveling and spreading, and we're certainly seeing changing patterns. And I think sort of whether we could actually find an infection that would actually promote longevity and ability to spread. But then you get into all these semantics. What is the best way for a pathogen to actually evolve? Do you want to kill your host and then to have to find another host? Or do you want to actually keep your host so it's able to carry on transmitting for a prolonged period of time? And Different infections follow different strategies. Whether you want to be an acute infection that spreads, kills your host, but rapidly spreads to many others. Or whether you want to go for a much more subtle, chronic, latent infection, where you're much more stealth-like. 
and your host is then able to go about their normal functions, for instance, syphilis, and sort of all kinds of things like that. It doesn't actually cause a particularly premature demise for the host. So it's just different strategies, and not all follow the same route. I think we have more questions than answers. No, this is thanks again for, for the talk. Thank you.